Clinical Judgment, Week 2. So each week we're going to go through a presentation that involves a case study and we're going to kind of walk through this together. I'm going to kind of guide you through it, hopefully giving you a little bit of time to think of some of the responses on your own. So this week, our case study is an 82-year-old female client has been admitted with a left hip fracture. She has a history of osteoporosis and diabetes mellitus type 2. The client lives alone but depends on her daughter for errands and appointments. But prior to her fall, she was independent with no history of dementia. Yesterday, the client had an open reduction internal fixation, or ORIF, of the hip. So we need to determine what findings are relevant or most important at this time. Let's walk through these together. So we do our assessment and the, these findings are what we come up with. We have an apical heart rate of 92 beats per minute and irregular. We have a blood pressure that is 166 over 90 millimeters of mercury. Breath sounds are clear in all lung fields. We know that's good, right? Uh, we have hypoactive bowel sounds times four quadrants. Well, hypoactive is not normal, but at the same time, we do expect to find this one day after surgery. But at least she's got bowel sounds, right? Restless and picking at bed linens. Her hip dressing is dry and intact. She yells when the operative leg is touched. There is no palpable left pedal pulse, but her right pedal pulse is present. Her left foot is cooler and paler than the right foot. Uh, pointing out here, you see what how important it is to compare these at the same time. Oxygen saturation is 95% on two liters per nasal cannula. Now understand that this is an acceptable rate but it's requiring two liters of oxygen to keep her there. And her finger stick blood glucose is 288. So now we need to determine what is particularly relevant to what is going on with this client. And as we just kind of look at these um, assessment findings, her main issue, it looks like, is going to be right here. Uh, yelling when that operative leg is touched, no palpable pedal pulse, the left foot is cooler. Doesn't mean that there are not other relevant cues, and I'll show you what I've come up with here in just a moment. So again, look at what's going on. Relevant cues, again, could potentially be something that's normal. It, we may have some abnormals that are not necessarily relevant. So pick out what is relevant, what is important to what is going on with this client. So this is what I've come up with. It uh, doesn't mean that they're the only ones because students often come up with things that I wasn't thinking of at the time. And this is the way nurses are. <clears throat> Depending on our frame of mind and our experience base, we may come up with different issues and different rationales that other nurses may not come up with. This is the importance, uh, demonstrates the importance of brainstorming together and collaborating. So the first one I picked out was that apical pulse is 92 beats per minute. We know that 92 is within our normal ranges, so we won't be too concerned about that, but we do know that it is on the higher side. But what's important is that it's irregular. Well, now we need to determine what could be causing that irregularity. That irregularity can indicate maybe there's an electrolyte imbalance. Maybe the client has heart issues and, you know, she has some kind of uh, heart disease or conduction problem. For example, maybe she has 
chronic atrial fibrillation and that would make it irregular. But maybe the stress of the injury and the surgery has caused the irregularity. We do know that this irregularity is going to create poor cardiac perfusion and potential tissue hypoxia. Now we look at the blood pressure. We know that elevation can be caused by a variety of things, such as pain, agitation, restlessness, the stress of the injury and the surgery. That irregular heartbeat can cause that blood pressure to go up because the heart is now having to work harder to perfuse the body. This is going to cause poor cardiac perfusion or poor uh, cardiac output, decreased cardiac output. She's restless and picking at the bed linens. What could cause this? Well, maybe there's delirium going on, pain, hypoxia. Hypoxia can cause confusion or that change in the mental status exhibited by that restlessness or agitation. Maybe she um, is just restless because she's hurting. So again, that pain. She yells when that operative leg is touched. Well, maybe unrelieved pain can cause that. Maybe she has decreased circulation. Decreased circulation can lead to ischemia. And the major symptom of ischemia is going to be significant pain. Maybe she has compartment syndrome. And remember, compartment syndrome is we have significant edema that is potentially compressing the blood vessels and or the nerves. And that can cause tissue ischemia. It also causes tremendous pain. We have a tissue hypoxia. No palpable left pedal pulse, but the right pedal pulse is present. Again, maybe this is compartment syndrome. Maybe this is edema. Maybe this is tissue hypoxia. The left foot is cooler and paler than the right foot. Again, compartment syndrome, edema, tissue hypoxia. Now, one thing I want you to notice is that I had the same potential causes for the uh, two different cues, but I'm listing them separately. So do not combine your cues. You need to list them separately. Okay. Finger stick blood glucose of 288 could be caused by increased stress. Remember, stress is going to cause the release of cortisol from the adrenal glands, and that cortisol is a steroid. And what do steroids do to our blood sugar? Well, it causes our blood sugar to elevate. Maybe she just has uncontrolled diabetes. Then we look at potential complications. If I don't take care of this, what could happen to my client is how you need to view this. Well, that irregular heartbeat, if we don't address that irregularity, it can lead to more irregularity, which can lead to an even greater lack of perfusion. So we're getting less oxygen to the body. And ultimately, that can cause organ failure and or death. The blood pressure elevation. If we do not address that blood pressure elevation, the two main complications of untreated hypertension is a CVA, the cardiovascular accident, or an aneurysm. Being restless and picking at bed linens 
Well, if delirium is unresolved, it can progress into dementia. And we know that dementia is going to be uh, permanent situation where delirium is a temporary situation. This also can increase the client's safety and or infection risk. Uh, they're not able to follow directions. They're pulling at the dressing, uh, getting their fingers in the wound, transmitting bacteria, uh, pulling at a Foley catheter, pulling out a drain, pulling out an IV, getting up and trying to walk, uh, Remember, with an ORIF, we are going to have to keep the legs abducted, and that prevents dislocation of that new joint. With the no palpable left pedal pulse, or I'm sorry, yells when the operative leg is touched, we know if this is not addressed, that it ultimately could lead to necrosis gangrene or amputation, the no palpable left pedal pulse can lead to necrosis, gangrene, potential amputation, left foot cooler and paler in color can lead to necrosis, gangrene, amputation. That elevated blood glucose, well, if that remains at such a high level, then we can begin having the micro and macrovascular changes that ultimately will lead to organ damage, such as kidney failure, uh, can affect the eyes, etc. So, what is going on with this client? What is the most likely explanation for what is happening? Well, you know, that could be a multitude of things, but what I've come up with is we have either a musculoskeletal surgical complication or, and could be and, we have decreased blood circulation as evidenced by that cooler foot, paler skin, and no pedal pulse. So what are our top three priorities for this client? What do we have to do to prevent the client from potentially dying or having a life altering event? Well, we have to improve circulation in that surgical leg, right? If we don't improve circulation, the client could lose their leg. If we do not reduce the client's acute pain, which, you know, she yells when you touch that leg, that's acute pain. And we know that that acute pain is probably caused by decreased circulation, by tissue ischemia. Then the client could potentially lose their leg. And if we do not manage the client's elevated blood sugar, we know that this client could ultimately have organ damage. So expected outcomes, what do we expect to happen based on those priorities that we identified? Well, we expect there to be adequate peripheral circulation in both lower extremities. We expect the client to have adequate pain control. So we don't expect all of the pain to be gone, but we do expect it to be at a manageable and or tolerable level of maybe a two to three out of 10. We also expect those vital signs to be within normal limits. And we expect to have a blood glucose within normal limits. Now understand blood glucose within normal limits is not necessarily going to be the same for every client. It's going to be individualized, but 288 is way too high. We need to get it down to at least 150, if not lower.
So now we need to look at what solutions we need to come up with. And we're going to do this by looking at the cues that we identified and the priorities that we identified. But before we do that, let's think about what members of the healthcare team are going to be involved and what duties would each member be involved with? Well, we definitely need the surgeon to come back because if we have a potential compartment syndrome, then uh, we may have to do a fasciotomy where we basically just create an incision in the area where the compartment syndrome is located to allow for additional edema and that will improve the circulation. Don't forget the nurse. Nurse is always going to be there. The nurse is going to be monitoring the client and doing the patient cares, administering medications, uh, administering treatments. We're also going to have physical therapy involved because physical therapy is going to be the ones who are teaching the client how to transfer, how to get out of bed, how to use the walker, etc. That would also include occupational therapy. We know, uh, or at least you will be learning, that the client should not bend greater than 90 degrees after having a hip surgery. So how do they put on their shoes? How do they put on their pants, etc.? And occupational therapy is going to help the client learn how to do these activities of daily living. We are also going to have lab involved. We need to be keeping track of uh, lab values, making sure there's no infection, etc. which, you know, elevated pain could be an indication of infection, but we are showing signs of poor perfusion. So I would guess that her pain is probably more likely due to poor perfusion. We're also going to have dietary involved because we need to make sure that the client is getting appropriate nutrition that is not going to elevate the blood sugar. We may involve an endocrinologist with the elevated blood sugar to make sure that we're following protocol. There might be some other members of the health care team involved, but so what would we not do? What actions should be avoided or would be contraindicated? Well, think about this. If we elevate the leg, we're going to cause what blood is getting to the foot to go downward by gravity. So they're going to have even less blood perfusion. So we would not want to do elevation. So what actions are going to be essential to meet those expected outcomes? Well, we definitely need to notify that surgeon. This is a potentially life altering situation going on here. And it's not something as a nurse that I would want to be taken care of by myself. So the surgeon needs to know uh, those peripheral circulation changes. We may want to check that pedal pulse with a Doppler ultrasound device to determine, am I just not able to palpate that pulse? Or is the pulse there, it's just non-palpable? We definitely want to give an analgesic as prescribed to help manage that pain. We definitely want to administer some insulin to help lower that blood glucose. So going with the issues of priority, we definitely need to improve that circulation. So notifying that surgeon would probably be the very first thing I do. 
but I also want to check that pulse with the Doppler to determine is the pulse completely absent or is it just non-palpable. I'm going to reduce that pain by administering the analgesic and then to manage that elevated glucose, I would administer regular insulin. Now, are these the only things that I would do? Probably not. There are definitely some other things that uh, might be done here, but those are going to be my priority interventions. So after we do all of this, now we need to evaluate. We need to determine, did the client meet those expected outcomes? So do I have adequate circulation peripherally in both lower extremities? Have I managed to bring that pain down? Are my vital signs within normal limits? Because remember, we had that significantly elevated uh, blood pressure and is my blood glucose within normal limits. If I have not met my expected outcomes, I need to go back and look at the interventions that I did. Number one, are they the appropriate interventions? Number two, do I need to tweak those interventions and do something just a little different. In other words, maybe do I need to change the medication that was ordered to alleviate pain? Or um, do I need to do something completely different? So we always evaluate every intervention that we do. Did it meet those expected outcomes? If not, I need to potentially tweak it and do something slightly different, or I need to do something completely different. So the next step that we're going to do, we've already gone through our case study. Now we're going to look at these four clients and determine which one is the priority. Who do I need to see first? If I don't see this client first, something really bad could happen. Is it the client with vital signs, blood pressure 98 over 66, heart rate of 86, respiratory rate of 16? <coughs> Excuse me. Is it my client with dyspnea, crackles in the lungs, and edema to bilateral lower extremities? Is it my client with COPD, an O2 saturation of 89% and a respiratory rate of 22? Is it my client who has a closed wrist fracture, pain level is 7 out of 10, heart rate of 110? So again, as you look at your priority, if I do not take care of this right now, something bad could happen to my client. Let's look at client number one. Yes, that blood pressure is a little on the lower side, but depending on the client, this may be a very normal blood pressure for this client or may be within the expected ranges of what the client's normal blood pressure is. For example, if their blood pressure is normally running around 105, we could expect the blood pressure to be on the lower side if they're at rest, if they're very comfortable. Uh, might be as high as 115 or 120 if they've been active. The client with dyspnea, crackles in the lungs, edema to bilateral lower extremities, we know that this client is experiencing some fluid volume overload. Uh, respiratory rate is being impaired. This is pretty important. We have the client with COPD, the lower oxygen saturation, the elevated respiratory rate. 
Well, remember, this client may live at this. This may be perfectly normal for a COPD client. We have the client with that close wrist fracture, the elevated pain level, the elevated heart rate. Yeah, that's pretty important. So we've basically narrowed it down to two and four. Which one is going to be most important? Well, look at your ABCs. Our airway, breathing, circulation is going to be more important than the pain level. So the correct answer would be number two. So now we're going to look at five NCLEX style questions and we're going to kind of break these down. The question is, a client reports dramatic changes in color and temperature of the skin over the left foot with intense burning pain, sensitive skin, excessive sweating, and edema. The healthcare provider makes a preliminary medical diagnosis of complex regional pain syndrome. What is the priority for nursing care? So the first thing we need to do is we need to figure out what is this question asking us? Well, we need to know an intervention. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what would be an intervention to deal with changes in the color and temperature of the left foot with intense burning pain and edema. What are the potential causes of this client's issue? Would help guide us to what we need to do for them. In determining what issue is a priority, now we need to look at limb or life-threatening issues if we don't take care of this issue first. So your potential answers are client education, prevention of skin breakdown, management of pain, assessment of circulation. Well, we're looking at all of these issues and we have changes in the color and temperature, we know that that is a circulatory issue. Okay, well, client education is important, as is preventing skin breakdown, as is keeping their pain under control. But the most important thing, if I don't take care of assessing circulation and they have a lack of circulation in that foot, they could lose their foot. So the correct answer would be four. The next question, we have an older client with a hip fracture with prolonged immobility related to difficulties in performing the prescribed weight bearing exercises based on fracture pathophysiology and the patient's abilities, what condition could the client develop? Okay, so what is this question asking? Basically, it's asking what are complications of immobility? So let's look at the responses. Is the issue due to osteomyelitis? Could the client develop internal derangement? Could the client develop a neuroma? Could the client develop a pulmonary embolism? Well, osteomyelitis is going to be an infection of the bone. Internal derangement, no. Neuroma, this is basically where uh, nerves are going to be caught up in scar tissue or a tangled mess, basically. Pulmonary embolism. Well, I know if my client is not moving, they're at 
increased risk for blood clots. A potential complication of a blood clot would be an embolus traveling to the lung, the pulmonary embolism. Next question. The nurse is caring for a client in Buck's traction. Remember, that's a skin traction. Actually, you may not remember this because we've not discussed this yet, but we will be in Module 4. Which task is best to delegate to unlicensed assistive personnel with supervision? So what is this question asking? Basically, you need to know what can the UAP do or not do. Sometimes it's easier to determine what they cannot do. Remember, UAPs cannot treat, they cannot assess, they cannot evaluate, they cannot monitor. Basically, they can just do basic cares. Not saying that some CNAs are not a little more advanced and they may be able to determine if something wrong is going on, but uh, officially per your textbook, they should not be doing any of those things. Responses, turning and repositioning, inspecting heels and sacral area, asking the client about muscle spasms, adjusting the weights on the apparatus. Well, CNAs can turn and reposition. If they're inspecting heels or the sacral area, I'm not saying they don't do that, but that is technically assessing. Well, CNAs cannot do that. Asking the client about muscle spasms, again, you are assessing. Adjusting the weights on the apparatus, this would be treating. Correct answer, number one. An older adult has skin traction in place for a hip fracture. Which outcome statement reflects that the goal of the therapy is successful? What is this question asking? Well, we need to know what the goals for skin traction are for a hip fracture. Your response choices are, client reports a decrease in painful muscle spasms. The x-ray indicates that the fracture shows signs of healing. The client can perform activities of daily living with some assistance. There are no signs, symptoms of compression syndrome. Well, again, we have not gone through this uh, module yet. We will do that in week four in KSPN 121. Traction is going to help reduce muscle spasms.